The Berlin Energy Transition Dialogue, dear ladies and gentlemen, stands not only for the discussions that we have here amongst ourselves, but also for a focus on networking with other organizations and also other summits that are dedicated to supporting the energy transition. And to that end, we send out our green sofa into the world, both literally, uh, especially uh, earlier, pre-pandemic, it was a literal object that was here on the stage, but we also send it out out virtually in the sense of being a platform for exchange. And in this session, we're on the sofa in spirit, as it were, the green at least is reflected here behind us. We are using the virtual green sofa to bring two of our traditional partners into dialogue with each other. It's our traditional dialogue between the heads of the International Energy Agency and the International Renewable Energy Agency, who after a very long hiatus are now with us again personally live in the Weltsaal, which I find utterly uh, delightful given the fact that I have seen both of you rather often uh, on screens in the last few years. So welcome Fatih Biro. Executive Director of the IEA, and Francesco La Camera, who is Director General of IRENA. And this is a compact time slot, dear gentlemen, so I am going to ask you to please keep your answers brief within the allotted time that we had discussed in advance of two minutes, if you would. I know it's a big ask, but I'm very grateful for your patience. And given all that we have been hearing this morning about the links between the current geopolitical tensions and the energy transition, I'd like to begin with the short-term perspective. Often we've done this the other way around, but I think today I'd really like to start start short term and ask you uh, to begin with uh, Fatih Birol. We are witnessing very significant market volatility, uh, high prices that both of the ministers uh, underlined. We're also uh, extremely uncertain about the future of oil and gas trade with Russia, which is one of the world's top exporters. So how great is the risk that we are facing to energy security, in your view? And are these developments a boost or a potential obstacle for the energy transition? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, you mentioned we are seeing uh, each other uh, uh, first time since uh, several uh, months, maybe. It is the first time that I am coming to uh, Berlin after a, a while, and I wanted to make a remark here to start with, which it is very unusual, it is for me. I am truly and deeply impressed with the new German government, how quickly, in a radical way, they responded to the Russian aggression in terms of trade, in terms of foreign policy, in terms of defense policy, in terms of energy policy. It is remarkable. I am somebody who follows the Germans since years, and uh, the German energy policy, the foreign policy, Bundesliga, all of them. And I can tell you that I am truly impressed. I, I wanted to just register this uh, in, in a clear way. It is a really a chapeau to uh, new German government. Second, coming to your question, we are going to see the first global energy crisis. Very simple, because Russia is number one exporter of oil in the world, number one natural gas exporter of the world. The actions that the countries around the world will take against Russia, the sanctions, plus possible some supply disruptions mean energy security will be a critical issue in the next months, if not uh, years to come. And our answer to Russia in my view, should be bold, should be nimble, but cool-headed. We have to come up with policy responses, both on the production side to replace the Russian oil and gas, but also on the demand side by uh, finding uh, ways to reduce the need for oil and gas. On the supply side, 
funding different uh, uh, producers on the demand side, renewable energies, energy efficiency, and we have for oil a big challenge through summer, because in summer oil demand goes up the driving season. In terms of natural gas, especially in Europe, we have a big challenge next winter. So for oil, the challenge is this summer for natural gas in Europe next winter. I finish my two minutes. I stop here. Thank you very much. And I want to pick up essentially on uh, a similar question with uh, Irina and uh, Francesco La Camera. The recent price volatility that we're seeing, these soaring uh, prices uh, for fossil fuels, are obviously a reminder that renewables have an inherent advantage for consumers. But do you think, at least in the short term, that we will really see a major acceleration in uptake of renewables coming out of this current geopolitical crisis? This is something that uh, uh, we have to see. But, uh, Francesco? Uh, I usually put uh, some, I something around. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, so this is something that uh, we have to see, uh, how we will move. Uh, because the situation is still, uh, still uncertainty. But uh, when we are talking about uh, this crisis, because uh, I naturally it's, uh, it's natural that we concentrate on what's happening now with the Ukrainian crisis. But I, I wish to, to put this in the general context of the fact that we have to start, we have supposed to start this, the leading from oil already two years ago, that uh, we are to, to pick gas by 2025, that we have to decrease emission by half 2030. So uh, I understand that uh, w there is a, a lot of attention of, uh, on this uh, short period, how we respond to this. But uh, we, have, we have to be conscious that uh, this is a moment, this is the moment that uh, show once more, how the centralized system based on fossil fuel was not able to provide for us a reliable energy system. So this is there, and uh, we, we have no the chance or the, the luxury to deal with the short term and the medium long term. We have to deal with this together. Yeah. On this, uh, I like to give you an example. I, I, I was three days ago in, in uh, Bangladesh they threw by helicopters to see a, a, a solar plant, and I asked it uh, how long it takes. You say eight months for a 35 megawatt, not a very big one, but 35 megawatt. You can uh, give energy for for a, a, a big a big a big city. So what is the short term? No. <laughs> so we have we have to start. Uh, we uh, we understand that uh, the, the 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 Germany has no. Uh, change program on nuclear to reactivate because uh, they could be ready in 2024. So they say it's not, it's not feasible. So we have not to talk about new infrastructure. There is no room economically, environmentally, there is no room. So when we respond to the short term, we have to think already to the medium or long term. Mm -hmm. So honestly, honestly, we have to have uh, a clear discussion, uh, that's, that's for sure, uh, but uh, uh, we came this year with our what energy outlook say very clear. Last year, say the windows closing for the 1.5. Today, we say if we don't act now in a very, uh, with the speed scale needed, please stop talking about 1.5. It will be not anymore there. Yeah, right. And uh, I'm afraid that also the two degrees will be not there, because one thing are the commitment, one thing are the trends that we are observing. And this uh, we have to make very clear in our report. So closing is a question of the political capacity to put willingness into the reality. And let me pick up on that point, uh, Fatih Birol, in regard to coal, because the IEA, the IEA recently warned that at a time when governments should be phasing out coal, demand is actually rising, and now more so than ever, of course, because of the Ukrainian crisis. So 
The previous panel reminded us that the challenges of phasing out coal are especially great for emerging and developing countries. How can we make sure we make progress globally on this key, key issue? So you are right. We, what we do at the IEA, every year we look at the global emissions. Do they increase? Do they get uh, lower, higher? And last month, when we looked at the emissions, because in Glasgow we heard very strong statements from the countries, but our numbers show that in the year 2021, last year, global emissions, all the emissions in the world, reached a historical high. We have never seen such a big number of emission increase. And the main reason was the search of coal, coal use in electricity generation. Now, my main worry, if I combine this with the current crisis we are in, my main worry is, especially as a result of high energy prices, Asia may start new, I underline new, coal investments, infrastructure, which could lock in the use of coal decades to come. So this is extremely important. And there is a role here for the Europe also uh, to think uh, what kind of policies Europe will uh, take, uh, including Germany, because we should not forget that the one ton of emissions going to atmosphere from Jakarta or from Detroit, or from Hamburg, or from Stockholm, it is the same effect on everybody. Mm -hmm. Emissions don't have a passport. So therefore, uh, coal is a major issue. And here, uh, this year, the IEA is uh, similar to what we did last year, the net zero roadmap for 2050, for the entire world. This year, we are making a how to bring the coal emissions to zero by 2050 without sacrificing the economic growth and energy security in the emerging countries. Thank you very much. Let me ask you, Francesco uh, La Camera, to talk a little bit about hard to abate sectors like industry, transport, uh, buildings, all of which contribute uh, a lot to global greenhouse emissions. Green hydrogen is often referred to as the fuel of cho choice for industry, but as Irina has pointed out, in fact, it has a long way to go before becoming competitive and affordable. Uh, that's for sure. Mi microphone. That's for sure that we have to pay uh, a priority attention to the end of use sector, and where hydrogen, as has been said also in the in the intervention by the minister, will play a very important role. But uh, uh, when we talk about the end use sectors, they are not all equal, in the sense that uh, some are less um, harder to 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 abate sectors. So probably in buildings, in these sectors, we are already advancing. And when we talk about where hydrogen could play really a difference, uh, we as ARENA, we don't say that uh, uh, hydrogen is, is not going to be competitive. It's going to be competitive in a very short time. But uh, we have to think about green hydrogen as uh, we have been able to uh, talk about renewables 10 years ago. So what is lacking is not uh, the, uh, uh, the green hydrogen uh, prices such, but the fact that there is not still a demand that make possible uh, to go the scale that is needed. And also this is very, is very daunting, honestly thinking. So we have uh, uh, today, I think, less than uh, 0.5 gigawatts of electrolyzer capacity. What we see about what's happening will bring us to, to 18 gigawatts by 2025. But we have to give uh, 360 gigawatts by 2030, if you want to be in line with uh, the electrification uh, through uh, green hydrogen or hydrogen uh, in uh, um, two of these sectors. So we have to understand what are the right policies for doing this. So we have to be able uh, uh, naturally, to uh, work on the supply side, by my point of view, it could be much more important work on the demand side. So all the industries that may use hydrogen 
and to be encouraged, to be supported, to make the change. If this will happen, so if the, the demand will be growing, so I think that uh, the uh, affirmation of grid hydrogen will become at a scale soon. We are going to have a hydrogen panel later on today, but per permit me to just briefly get a take from both of you on a really critical aspect of the shift, not only to hydrogen, but also to other uh, renewable clean energy uh, sources. And it's this, and it's interestingly enough, the lead topic for this week's Economist, uh, namely the geopolitics of supply of the crucial minerals, rare earths, and other materials that are in fact needed for PV equipment, wind equipment. Uh, how can we, Fatih Birol, ensure the supply of these commodities that are crucial for the energy transition, many of which are also geographically concentrated and not necessarily in countries with great governance systems? So, uh, this, uh, I mean, today, when it comes to energy security, it is Russia and natural gas. Tomorrow, it is lithium, another country, if we do not change the current situation. The, I read the economists as well. They have uh, made a nice, uh, very nice charts and everything uh, very clearly uh, expressed the problem based on our uh, work at the IEA. The, if I can summarize, the top three critical minerals, lithium, cobalt, and rare earth materials, their production, this three, 75 percent of the global production is concentrated in three countries. I mean, three countries are producing 75 percent of all these three critical uh, uh, materials. Tomorrow, whoever this country uh, is, it may be a bit good intention, bad intention, to rely the entire electric cars, windmills, solar panels, to a very few number of countries in a concentrated manner is a risk. So it is the reason we have to find ways to address this issue, ranging from other countries to uh, uh, produce those critical minerals to bringing uh, some safety nets. Last uh, week, there was the International Energy Agency ministerial meeting uh, chaired by the U.S. Secretary of Energy, Mrs. Granholm. Forty ministers around the world were in Paris, and they have decided to ask the IEA to build a safety network on the critical minerals and coordinate among the countries to uh, be ready for the rainy days. Thank you very much. And let me get Francesco La Camera's uh, take on the same question, including not only the geopolitics of uh, renewables as such, but also the geopolitics of green hydrogen, because in fact, Irina recently put out a study on that subject that points out that in fact, this could potentially go either way. It could be a system stabilizer, but it could also be destabilizing unless certain conditions are met. So, uh, first of all, on, uh, on the, in the middle of the red rest, the red rest are not rare geologically. So, Fatih is right in saying that uh, uh, for the time being, uh, uh, the production is concentrated in a, in a few number of countries, uh, but uh, it's possible work on mining in more countries, so to, to diversify the offer. So, this is uh, a first point. The second is that uh, uh, we have to work to ensure that uh, we will work on the market not like predator, but try also to, to let the benefits of, uh, of the mining stay in the country they are producing uh, these minerals or now red earth. This could be uh, support the country also to uh, provide for a stable offer of, uh, of these elements. The third point is that the innovation is already there, and we see that the dependency from uh, this mineral earth is, is decreasing day after day. And uh, we think also that moving on, on the batteries and the, the possibility of recycling or the, 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 the potential of circular economy is there. So we don't see that uh, we have to pay the due attention, but I don't see this as a, as a barrier 
for, uh, for the energy transition and for the affirmation of renewables. Uh, concerning green hydrogen, I, I wish to be very brief because I want to stay in my time. We have made clear that uh, uh, the green hydrogen has the potential to bring many actors into the market. This means that uh, we can move slowly to a system that may look like more to a, a, a competitive system so that we will, uh, how to say, diminish the, the rent that is uh, nowadays on the market and uh, will ensure that uh, more independency in, uh, in, uh, in the energy uh, system. So we will have, uh, I think that the minister, the German minister say that uh, how it's possible to, to go from a decentralized to, uh, to a centralized, to a centralized system, bringing more democracy into the management of uh, the energy system. Thank you very much. I'm getting word from uh, our organizers that time is flying by and that we have just a couple of minutes left on the clock. So let me ask both of you to speak very briefly to a crucial point that both of your organizations have emphasized uh, in a great deal of analysis that you've done, namely how we unlock adequate resources, adequate financial flows for a truly inclusive energy transition that is also at the speed that we need. Um, your key messages, Fadi Biro. So, first of all, I would like um, two things maybe. First, we are seeing a, every day in television, in the social media, a humanitarian crisis in Ukraine. This is incredible. And this is not a, a Russia-Ukraine crisis. This is a Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I want to put the name of it. Yeah. This is number one. But this humanitarian crisis is causing an energy crisis, we all know. And we should not forget the third crisis, which is the climate crisis. So as a result of that, what I am saying is the governments that are taking now measures in order to address this energy crisis should not create additional barriers to reach our climate goals. And here, when it comes to resources, financing, investments, I think we should pay a special attention to how we are going to mobilize investments, clean energy investment, renewable efficiency, electric cars, and others in the emerging world where the bulk of the emissions will come from. Thank you. Thank you very much. That certainly underlines a message we heard in our last panel. Um, Francesco La Camera, same question to you. You said we shouldn't be distinguishing between short term and longer term. We need to be moving now. So your key message on financial resources. I think, Melina, that you will start to love me in the sense that to say, read this. This is the answer that of Arena to link the short term to the medium long term response. Thank you very much. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. Do we, will we find this online? Because it's great to see that thing known as paper, but uh, I suppose it's that online. many, <laughs> it's online. So Irina's website tells you everything you need to know about the answer to that question. To both of you, many, many warm thanks for being with us for this very interesting, far-reaching dialogue. I wish we'd had more time, but you've really con managed to compress a lot of messages into a short space of dialogue. Thank you so much. <laughs>